Part two of the County Regiment. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Epistomolus. The County Regiment by Dudley L. Vale. Part two. Washington, in September 1862, while relatively secure from the easy capture which would have been possible in the summer of the previous year, was not in a situation of such safety as to preclude anxiety, for Pope had just been beaten at Bull Run, and Lee's army was north of the Potomac in the first of its memorable invasions of the loyal states. On the very day of his check at Antietam, September 17th, the 19th Connecticut Volunteers reached the capital, and the next day moved into the hostile state of Virginia, bivouacking near Alexandria. In this vicinity the regiment was destined to remain for many months, and to learn, as far as was possible without the grim teachings of actual experience, the business for which it was gathered. At first there was a constant expectation of orders to join the army in active operations. The county newspapers for many weeks noted regularly that the regiment was still near Alexandria. But orders to march are hourly expected. It was good fortune, however, that none came, for not a little of the credit of its later service was due to the proficiency in discipline and soldierly qualities gained in the long months now spent in preparation. The task of giving the necessary military education to the thousand-odd men fresh from the ordinary routine of rural Connecticut life fell upon the shoulders of Lieutenant Colonel Kellogg, and by all the testimony available, most of all by the splendid proof they later gave, it is clear that it was entrusted to a master hand. Matters of organization and administration at first engrossed Colonel Wessel's attention. Ill health soon supervened, and later he was given the command of a brigade. The regiment from its beginning was Kellogg's, and he received in due course the commission vacated by its first commander in September 1863. A thorough and well-tried soldier himself, he quickly gained the respect of his command by his complete competency, and its strong and admiring affection was not slow in following. There are men among us to this day for whom no superlatives are adequate to give expression to their feelings in regard to him. As the regimental history records of their career, there is not a scene, a day, nor a memory from Camp Dutton to Grapevine Point that can be wholly divested of Kellogg. Like the ancient eastern king who suddenly died on the eve of an engagement, and whose remains were bolstered up in warlike aptitude in his chariot, and followed by his enthusiastic soldiers to battle and to victory, so this mighty leader, although falling in the very first onset, yet went through every succeeding march and fight, and won posthumous victories for the regiment which may be said to have been born of his loins. Battalion and company, officer and private, arms and quarters, camp and drill, command and obedience, honor and duty, esprit and excellence, every moral and material belonging of the regiment bore the impress of his genius. In the eyes of civilians, Colonel Kellogg was nothing but a horrid, strutting, shaggy monster, but request any one of the survivors of the 19th Infantry or the 2nd Artillery to name the most perfect soldier he ever saw, and this will surely be the man. Or ask him to conjure up the ideal soldier of his imagination. Still the same figure, complete in feature, gesture, gauntlet, saber, boot, spur, observant eye and commanding voice will stalk with majestic port upon the mental vision. He seemed the superior of all superiors, and major generals shrunk into pygmy corporals in comparison with him. In every faculty of body, mind, heart, and soul, he was built after a large pattern. His virtues were large, and his vices were not small. As Lincoln said of Seward, he could swear magnificently. His nature was versatile, and full of contradictions sometimes exhibiting the tenderest sensibilities, and sometimes not at all. Now he would be in the hospital tent, bending with streaming eyes over the victims of fever, and kissing the dying Corporal Webster, and an hour later would find him down at the guardhouse, prying open the jaws of a refractory soldier with a bayonet in order to insert a gag, or in anger drilling a battalion for the fault of a single man to the last point of endurance or shamefully abusing the most honorable and faithful officers in the regiment, in rage, deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. 
but notwithstanding his frequent ill-treatment of officers and soldiers, he had a hold on their affections such as no other commander ever had, or could have. The men who were cursing him one day for the almost intolerable rigors of his discipline would in twenty-four hours be throwing up their caps for him, or subscribing to buy him a new horse, or petitioning the governor not to let him be jumped. The man who sat on the sharp-backed wooden horse in front of the guardhouse would sometimes watch the motions of the colonel on drill or parade until he forgot the pain and disgrace of his punishment in admiration of the man who had inflicted it. It is not hard to understand the hold he gained through a personality so striking and forceful upon the men of his command. They were but boys for the most part, in point of fact, and open to the influence of just such strength and perhaps also just such weaknesses as they saw in this splendidly virile and genuine and very human character. Colonel Kellogg was a Litchfield County man, a native of New Hartford, and at this time about thirty-eight years of age. His education was not of the schools, but gained from years of adventurous life as a sailor, gold hunter, and wanderer. Shortly before the war he had settled in his native state, but he responded to the call for the national defense among the very first, and before the organization of the 19th had served as major of the 1st Connecticut Artillery. He lies buried in Winstead. For more than a year and a half the regiment was numbered among the defenders of the capital, removing after a few months from the immediate neighborhood of Alexandria, and being stationed among the different forts and redoubts which formed the line of defense south of the Potomac. Important as its service there was, and novel as it must have been to Litchfield County boys, it was not marked by incidents of any note, and furnished nothing to attract attention among the general and absorbing operations of the war. It was, still, of vast interest to the people of the home towns. The county newspapers had many letters to print in those days from the soldiers themselves, and from visitors from home, who in no inconsiderable numbers were journeying down to look in upon them constantly. There were, of course, matters of various nature, which gave rise to complaints of different degrees of seriousness. There was not unnaturally much sickness among the men in the early part of their service. There were political campaigns at home, in which the volunteers had showed some strong interest. There was a regrettable quarrel among the officers, in which Lieutenant Colonel Kellogg was placed in an unfortunate light, and the termination of which gave the men an opportunity of showing their feeling for him. All these matters were well aired in type. Meanwhile the regiment, doing well such duty as was laid upon it, grew in efficiency for hard and active service when it should be called for. The possibility of a call to action at almost any minute was seen in April 1863, when orders came that the regiment be held ready to march. Reinforcements were going forward to the Army of the Potomac, now under Hooker, in large numbers. But the 19th was finally left in the defenses. Thus months were passed in the routine of drill and parade, guard mounting and target practice, varied by brief and rare furloughs, while the lightnings of the mighty conflict raging so near left them untouched. Yet, it is related, a good many seemed to be in all sorts of affliction, and were constantly complaining because they could not go to the front. A year later, when the soldiers of the 19th were staggering along the Pamunkey, with heavy loads and blistered feet, or throwing up breastworks with their coffee pots all night under fire in front of Petersburg, they looked back to the defenses of Washington as to a lost Elysium. It was in November 1863 that the War Department orders were issued changing the 19th Infantry to a regiment of heavy artillery, which Governor Buckingham denominated the Second Connecticut. Artillery drill had for some time been part of its work, and the general efficiency and good record of the regiment in all particulars was responsible for the change, which was a welcome one, as the artillery was considered a very desirable branch of the service, and the increase in size gave prospects of speedier promotions. Recruiting had been necessary almost all the time to keep the regiment up to the numerical standard. Death and the discharge for disability had been operating from the first. It was now needful to fill it up to the artillery standard of 1,800 men, and this was successfully accomplished. 
officers and men were dispatched to Connecticut to gather recruits, and their advertisements set forth enticingly the advantage of joining a command so comfortably situated as this famous regiment in the defenses of Washington, where, it was permissible to infer, it was permanently stationed, a belief which had come to be generally held. The effort, however, was not confined by geographical limits, and a large part of the men secured were strangers to Litchfield County. Before the 1st of March, 1864, over 1,100 recruits were received, and with the nucleus of the old regiment quickly formed into an efficient command. This vast body of recruits was made up of all sorts of men, the history of the regiment states. A goodly portion of them were no less intelligent, patriotic, and honorable than the old 19th, and that is praise enough. Another portion of them were not exactly the worst kind of men, but those adventurous and uneasy varlets who always want to get out of jail when they are in, and in when they are out. Furloughed sailors, for example, who had enlisted just for fun, while ashore, with no definite purpose of remaining in the land service for any tedious length of time. And lastly, there were about three hundred of the most thorough-paced villains that the stews and slums of New York and Baltimore could furnish. Bounty jumpers, thieves, and cutthroats, who had deserted from regiment after regiment, in which they had enlisted under fictitious names, and who now proposed to repeat the operation. And they did repeat it. No less than two hundred and fifty deserted before the middle of May, very few of whom were ever retaken and returned to the regiment. There were rebels in Alexandria who furnished deserters with citizens' clothes, and thus their capture became almost impossible. At first, and perhaps to some extent always, there was a mental distinction made by the men between those who had originally enlisted in the old 19th and the large body which was now joined to that organization, many of whom had never seen the Litchfield Hills. But there was enough character in the original body to give its distinct tone to the enlarged regiment. Its officers were all of the first enlistment, and the common sufferings and successes which soon fell to their lot quickly deprived this distinction of any invidiousness. The second artillery was always known, and proudly known, as the Litchfield County Regiment. There came to the second Connecticut heavy artillery, on May 17, 1864, the summons which, after such long immunity, it had almost ceased to expect. The preceding two weeks had been among the most eventful of the war. They had seen the crossing of the Rapidan by Grant on the 4th, and the terrible battles for days following in the wilderness and at Spotsylvania, depleting the army by such enormous losses as even this war had hardly seen before. Heavy reinforcements were demanded and sent forward from all branches of the service. In the emergency this artillery regiment was summoned to fight as infantry, and so served until the end of the conflict, though for a long time with a hope, which survived many disappointments, of being assigned to its proper work with the heavy guns. It started for the front on May 18, 1864, and on the 20th reached the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac and was assigned to the 2nd Brigade, 1st Division of the 6th Corps, now under Major General Horatio G. Wright, another leader of Connecticut origin, who had succeeded to the command of the Corps on the death a few days before of Litchfield County's most noted soldier, John Sedgwick. The famous series of movements by the left flank was in progress, and the regiment was in active motion at once. For more than a week following its arrival at the front, it was on the march practically all the time while Grant pushed southward. To troops unaccustomed to anything more arduous than drilling in the defenses at Washington, it was almost beyond the limits of endurance. At the start, without experience in campaigning, the men had overburdened themselves with impedimenta, which it was very soon necessary to dispense with. The amount of personal effects then thrown away, wrote the chaplain Reverend Winthrop H. Phelps, has been estimated by officers who witnessed and have carefully calculated it to be from twenty to thirty thousand dollars. To this amount must be added the loss to the government in the rations and ammunition left on the way. On some of the marches days were passed with scarcely anything to eat, and it is recorded that raw corn was eagerly gathered, kernel by kernel, 
in empty granaries and eaten with relish. Heat, dust, rain, mud, and a rate of movement which taxed to the utmost the powers of the strongest gave to these untried troops a savage hint of the hardships of campaigning into which they had been plunged without any gradual steps of breaking in, and much more terrible experiences were close at hand. Of these there came a slight foretaste in a skirmish with the enemy on the 24th, near Jericho Ford on the North Anna River, resulting in the death of one man and the wounding of three others, the first of what was soon to be a portentous list of casualties. The movements of both armies were bringing them steadily nearer to Richmond, and but one chance now remained to achieve the object of the campaign the defeat of Lee's army north of the Chickahominy, and away from the strong defenses of the Confederate capital. The enemy, swinging southward to conform to Grant's advance, finally reached the important point of Cold Harbor on May 31st. Cavalry was sent forward to dislodge him, and seized some of the entrenchments near that place, while both armies were hurried forward for the inevitable battle. The Sixth Corps, of which the second artillery was part, reached its position on the extreme left near noon on June 1st, having marched since midnight, and awaited the placing of other troops before the charge, which had been ordered to take place at five o'clock. It would have been a fearful waiting for these men could they have known what was in store for them, but they were drugged, as it were, with utter fatigue. The almost constant movement of their two weeks of active service had left them so nearly dead with marching and want of sleep that they could not notice or comprehend the significant movements of the columns of troops about them preparing for battle, or the artillery which soon opened fire on both sides. Their stupor, it is related, was of a kind that none can describe. They heard without excitement the earnest instructions of Colonel Kellogg, who, in pride and anxiety at this first trial of his beloved command, was in constant consultation with officers and men, directing, encouraging, explaining. He marked out on the ground, writes one of his staff, the shape of the works to be taken, told the officers what dispositions to make of the different battalions, how the charge was to be made, spoke of our reputation as a bandbox regiment, now we are called upon to show what we can do at fighting. The brigade commander, General Emery Upton, was also watching closely this new regiment, which had never been in battle, but all foreboding was spared, most of the men, through sheer exhaustion. End of Part 2 Recording by Epistomolus, Cupertino, California epcomm dot com slash school